The Nectar of Devotion, The Complete Science of Bhakti Yoga, a summary study of Srila Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. In this video, I'm going to read the dedication and preface. To the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, Nana Shastra Vicharan Naika Nipuno Sad Dharma Sang Sta Pako Loka Nang Hita Karino Tri Bhuvane Manyo Sharan Yakoro Radha Krishna Pada Ravinda Bhajanan Nandana Mataliko Vande Rupa Sanatano Raghu Yugo Sri Jiva Gopalako. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis, namely Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatt Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami and Sri Gopal Bhatt Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus, they are honored all over the three worlds and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha, and Krishna. Preface. The Nectar of Devotion is a summary study of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which was written in Sanskrit by Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. He was the chief of the six Goswamis who were the direct disciples of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When he first met Lord Chaitanya, Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada was engaged as a minister in the Mohammedan government of Bengal. He and his brother Sanatan were then named Dabira Kasa and Sakara Malika, respectively, and they held responsible posts as ministers of Nawab Hussein Shah. At that time, 500 years ago, the Hindu society was very rigid, and if a member of the Brahmin caste accepted the service of a Mohammedan ruler, he was at once rejected from Brahmin society. That was the position of the two brothers, Dabira Kasa and Sakara Malika. They belonged to the highly situated Saraswata Brahmin community, but they were ostracized due to their acceptance of ministerial posts in the government of Hussein Shah. It is the grace of Lord Chaitanya that he accepted these two exalted personalities as his disciples and raised them to the position of Goswamis, the highest position of Brahminical culture. Similarly, Lord Chaitanya accepted Haridas Thakur as his disciple, although Haridas happened to be born of a Mohammedan family. And Lord Chaitanya later on made him the Acharya of the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Chaitanya's principle is universal. Anyone who knows the science of Krishna and is engaged in the service of the Lord is accepted as being in a higher position than a person born in the family of a Brahmin. That is the original principle accepted by all Vedic literatures, especially by Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. The principle of Lord Chaitanya's movement in educating and elevating everyone to the exalted post of a Goswami is taught in the Nectar of Devotion. Lord Chaitanya met the two brothers, Dabira Kasa and Sakara Malika, in a village known as Ramakeli, in the district of Malda. And after that meeting, the brothers decided to retire from government service and join Lord Chaitanya. Dabira Kasa, who was later to become Rupa Goswami, retired from his post and collected all the money he had accumulated during his service. It is described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that his accumulated savings in gold coins equaled millions of dollars 
and filled a large boat. He divided the money in a very exemplary manner, which should be followed by devotees in particular and by humanity in general. 50% of his accumulated wealth was distributed to the Krishna conscious persons, namely the Brahmins and the Vaishnavas. 25% was distributed to relatives, and 25% was kept against emergency expenditures and personal difficulties. Later on, when Sakara Malika also proposed to retire, the Nawab was very much agitated and put him into jail. But Sakara Malika, who was later to become Srila Sanatan Goswami, took advantage of his brother's personal money, which had been deposited with a village banker, and escaped from the prison of Hussein Shah. In this way, both brothers joined Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Rupa Goswami first met Lord Chaitanya at Prayag, Allahabad, India, and on the Dashashwamedha bathing ghat of that holy city, the Lord instructed him continually for ten days. The Lord particularly instructed Rupa Goswami on the science of Krishna consciousness. These teachings of Lord Chaitanya to Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada are narrated in our book, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Later, Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada elaborated the teachings of the Lord with profound knowledge of revealed scriptures and authoritative references from various Vedic literatures. Srila Srinivasa Acharya describes in his prayers to the six Goswamis that they were all highly learned scholars, not only in Sanskrit, but also in foreign languages, such as Persian and Arabic. They very scrutinizingly studied all the Vedic scriptures in order to establish the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on the authorized principles of Vedic knowledge. The present Krishna consciousness movement is also based on the authority of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. We are therefore generally known as Rupa Nugas, or followers in the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. It is only for our guidance that Srila Rupa Goswami prepared his book Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which is now presented in the form of the nectar of devotion. Persons engaged in the Krishna consciousness movement may take advantage of this great literature and be very solidly situated in Krishna consciousness. Bhakti means devotional service. Every service has some attractive feature which drives the servitor progressively on and on. Every one of us within this world is perpetually engaged in some sort of service, and the impetus for such service is the pleasure we derive from it. Driven by affection for his wife and children, a family man works day and night. A philanthropist works in the same way for love of the greater family, and a nationalist for the cause of his country and countrymen. That force which drives the philanthropist, the householder, and the nationalist is called rasa, or a kind of mellow relationship, whose taste is very sweet. Bhakti rasa is a mellow different from the ordinary rasas enjoyed by mundane workers. Mundane workers labor very hard day and night in order to relish a certain kind of rasa which is understood as sense gratification. The relish or taste of the mundane rasa does not long endure, and therefore mundane workers are always apt to change their position of enjoyment. A businessman is not satisfied by working the whole week, therefore wanting a change for the weekend, he goes to a place where he tries to forget his business activities. Then, after the weekend is spent in forgetfulness, he again changes his position and resumes his actual business activities. Material engagement means accepting a particular status for some time and then changing it. This position of changing back and forth is technically known as boga tiaga, which means a position of alternating sense enjoyment and renunciation. A living entity cannot steadily remain either in sense enjoyment or in renunciation. Change is going on perpetually, and we cannot be happy in, the, in either state because of our eternal constitutional position. Sense gratification does not endure for long, and it is therefore called chapala sukha, or flickering happiness. 
For example, an ordinary family man who works very hard day and night and is successful in giving comforts to the members of his family thereby relishes a kind of mellow, but his whole advancement of material happiness immediately terminates along with his body as soon as his life is over. Death is therefore taken as the representative of God for the atheistic class of men. The devotee realizes the presence of God by devotional service, whereas the atheist realizes the presence of God in the shape of death. At death, everything is finished, and one has to begin a new chapter of life in a new situation, perhaps higher or lower than the last one. In any field of activity, political, social, national, or international, the result of our actions will be finished with the end of life. That is sure. Bhakti rasa, however, the mellow relished in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, does not finish with the end of life. It continues perpetually and is therefore called amrita, that which does not die but exists eternally. This is confirmed in all Vedic literatures. Bhagavad Gita says that a little advancement in bhakti rasa can save the devotee from the greatest danger, that of missing the opportunity for human life. The rasas derived from our feelings in social life, in family life, or in the greater family life of altruism, philanthropy, nationalism, socialism, communism, etc., do not guarantee that one's next life will be as a human being. We prepare our next life by our actual activities in the present life. A living entity is offered a particular type of body as a result of his action in the present body. These activities are taken into account by a superior authority known as daiva, or the authority of God. This daiva is explained in Bhagavad Gita as the prime cause of everything, and in Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated that a man takes his next body by daiva netrena, which means by the supervision of the authority of the Supreme. In an ordinary sense, daiva is explained as destiny. Daiva supervision gives us a body selected from 8,400,000 forms. The choice does not depend on our selection, but is awarded to us according to our destiny. If our body at present is engaged in the activities of Krishna consciousness, then it is guaranteed that we will have at least a human body in our next life. A human being engaged in Krishna consciousness, even if unable to complete the course of Bhakti Yoga, takes birth in the higher divisions of human society so that he can automatically further his advancement in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, all bona fide activities in Krishna consciousness are amrita, or permanent. This is the subject matter of the nectar of devotion. This eternal engagement in bhakti ras can be understood by a serious student upon studying the nectar of devotion. Adoption of bhakti ras or Krishna consciousness will immediately bring one to an auspicious life free from anxieties and will bless one with transcendental existence, thus minimizing the value of liberation. Bhakti ras itself is sufficient to produce a feeling of liberation because it attracts the attention of the Supreme Lord Krishna. Generally, neophyte devotees are anxious to see Krishna or God, but God cannot be seen or known by our present material by our present materially blunt senses. The process of devotional service as it is recommended in the nectar of devotion will gradually elevate one from the material condition of life to the spiritual status, wherein the devotee becomes purified of all designations. The senses can then become uncontaminated, being constantly in touch with bhakti ras. When the purified senses are employed in the service of the Lord, one becomes situated in bhakti ras life and any action performed for the satisfaction of Krishna in this transcendental bhakti ras stage of life can be relished perpetually. When one is thus engaged in devotional service, all varieties of rasas or mellows turn into eternity. In the beginning, one is trained according to the principles of regulation under the guidance of the acharya or spiritual master. And gradually, when one is elevated, devotional service becomes automatic and spontaneous eagerness to serve Krishna. There are 12 kinds of rasas, as will be explained in this book, and by renovating our relationship with Krishna in five primary rasas, we can live eternally in full knowledge and bliss. The basic principle of the living condition is 
that we have a general propensity to love someone. No one can live without loving someone else. This propensity is present in every living being. Even an animal like a tiger has this loving propensity at least in a dormant stage, and it is certainly present in the human beings. The missing point, however, is where to repose our love so that everyone can become happy. At the present moment, the human society teaches one to love his country or family or his personal self, but there is no information where to repose the loving propensity so that everyone can become happy. That missing point is Krishna, and the nectar of devotion teaches us how to stimulate our original love for Krishna and how to be situated in that position where we can enjoy our blissful life. In the primary stage, a child loves his parents, then his brothers and sisters, and as he daily grows up, he begins to love his family, society, community, country, nation, or even the whole human society. But the loving propensity is not satisfied even by loving all human society. That loving propensity remains imperfectly fulfilled until we know who is the Supreme Beloved. Our love can be fully satisfied only when it is reposed in Krishna. This theme is the sum and substance of the nectar of devotion, which teaches us how to love Krishna in five different transcendental mellows. Our loving propensity expands just as a vibration of light or air expands, but we do not know where it ends. The nectar of devotion teaches us the science of loving everyone, every one of the living entities, perfectly by the easy method of loving Krishna. We have failed to create peace and harmony in human society, even by such great attempts as the United Nations, because we do not know the right method. The method is very simple, but one has to understand, understand it with a cool head. The nectar of devotion teaches all men how to perform the simple and natural method of loving Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If we learn how to love Krishna, then it is very easy to immediately and simultaneously love every living being. It is like pouring water on the root of a tree or supplying food to one's stomach. The method of pouring water on the root of a tree or supplying foodstuffs to the stomach is universally scientific and practical, as every one of us has experienced. Everyone knows well that when we eat something, or in other words, when we put foodstuffs in the stomach, the energy created by such action is immediately distributed throughout the whole body. Similarly, when we pour water on the root, the energy thus created is immediately distributed throughout the entirety of even the largest tree. It is not possible to water the tree part by part, nor is it possible to feed the different parts of the body separately. The nectar of devotion will teach us how to turn the one switch that will immediately brighten everything everywhere. One who does not know this method is missing the point of life. As far as material necessities are concerned, the human civilization at the present moment is very much advanced in living comfortably, but still we are not happy because we are missing the point. The material comforts of life alone are not sufficient to make us happy. The vivid example is America, the richest nation of the world, having all facilities for material comfort, is producing a class of men completely confused and frustrated in life. I am appealing herewith to such confused men to learn the art of devotional service as directed in the nectar of devotion. And I am sure that the fire of material existence burning within their hearts will be immediately extinguished. The root cause of our dissatisfaction is that our dormant loving propensity has not been fulfilled despite our great advancement in the materialistic way of life. The nectar of devotion will give us practical hints how we can live in this material world perfectly engaged in devotional service and thus fulfill all our desires in this life and the next. The nectar of devotion is not presented to condemn any way of materialistic life, but the attempt is to give information to religionists, philosophers, and people in general how to love Krishna. One may live without material discomfiture, but at the same time he should learn the art of loving Krishna. 
At the present moment, we are inventing so many ways to utilize our propensity to love, but factually, we are missing the real point, Krishna. We are watering all parts of the tree, but missing the tree's root. We are trying to keep our body fit by all means, but we are neglecting to supply foodstuffs to the stomach. Missing Krishna means missing one's self also. Real self-realization and realization of Krishna go together simultaneously. For example, seeing oneself in the morning means seeing the sunrise also. Without seeing the sunshine, no one can see himself. Similarly, unless one has realized Krishna, there is no question of self-realization. The nectar of devotion is specifically presented for persons who are now engaged in the Krishna consciousness movement. I beg to offer my sincere thanks to all my friends and disciples who are helping me to push forward the Krishna consciousness movement in the Western countries, and I beg to acknowledge with thanks the contribution made by my beloved disciple Sriman Jayananda Brahmachari. My thanks are due as well to the directors of ISKCON Press who have taken so much care in publishing this great literature. Hare Krishna, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, April 13, 1970, ISKCON Headquarters, 3764 Watsika Avenue, Los Angeles, California. <laughs>